your host, Rob Lively, and this is Telling Tales, Western Maine Story Place, where we feature outstanding tellers. Today, I'm pleased to report that today's program is part of our six-part series on peace, peace building, and the role of storytelling in that process. We have labeled the series Building Peace Story by Story. It's a cooperative relationship between Mount Blue Television, Western Main Story, and the national nonprofit Peace Alliance. In the six tellers, three are going to be representing the Peace Alliance, and three will be representing Western Main Storytelling. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce Laura Sims, who is an internationally acclaimed storyteller, writer, an educator advocating engaged storytelling as compassionate action for personal and community transformation. The New York Times describes Laura as irresistible, a major force in the revival of storytelling in America. So Laura, welcome to the show and thanks for joining us. Thank you. I can think of a, a better focus than, than this and all the people who will be listening to these stories and to be part of the main storytelling coalition today. Well, gr great, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Do you wanna say something about your background and how it has led up to your, your concern and interest in personal and community transformation? Well, I began telling stories when I was quite young with sort of an accidental event, but um, while telling the story, I had the sense that something remarkable had happened between myself and the audience, which was what I was searching for when I dropped out of graduate school after three days to join a theater company <laughs> in New York City. But here it was, something that I wanted to understand. So I sort of set myself a task of learning stories and telling stories in different situations to explore what that was beyond the sort of obvious sort of psychoanalytical interpretation or moral lessons of the story. There was something that occurred between myself and the audience that felt so extraordinary. And in a way I have continued and devoted my life to uncovering what that is and how useful that is, actually powerful that is, in our world today. Hmm. Very good. In an earlier conversation, you mentioned that how important it is of knowing the context of what your, of your audience and how storytelling works in that situation. So that sounds exactly like what you were saying. The importance <laughs> of knowing the context and, and how storytelling can actually change people. Well, do you want to share some of your thoughts that, with us today about storytelling? Well, um, I it's so hard to choose from all the fabulous stories and interesting situations. But I decided that I would tell you about the very first time I realized storytelling as um, a piece of uh, advocacy, a peace event, uh, or a violence prevention event, or a, even a conf setting the ground for conflict resolution. And I was hired, a sort of last ditch endeavor by the principal of a school in the South Bronx. She asked if I could come in every day for five days and tell stories to the fourth grade. They were four classes, and they were involved with racial conflict, with violence, and there were many, many children who didn't speak English and therefore were being punished or bullied as if they were stupid. And I agreed, not exactly knowing what to do and sort of conjured up a program. So the first day I saw three fourth grade groups. And it was not easy, but with storytelling, they got into it. Great, but I was worn out. And my major thought was, why did I ever agree to do 
four before lunch. <laughs> <laughs> when suddenly I heard this sound, it was like a, a stampede or stones falling off the side of a mountain and screaming and the walls of the library shook. The librarian, who was my host, leaned toward me and said, that's your next class. We saved the worst for the last, as if that was going to relax me. When the doors burst open, the kids came in. They were in a fury. They were pushing each other. They were screaming. Girls were pulling each other's hair. And the teacher, suddenly, as if she was completely deranged, grabbed a boy. And I thought, she's going to throw him out the window. And I had no idea what to do. So I just stopped. And for an instant, I felt how extraordinarily alive the energy of that room was. And I could feel it in my body before I thought about what I feared or what I felt about what was going on. And spontaneously, not really thinking, I just out of that place, not out of aggression, but the energy said, stop. Everyone stopped. I said, okay, how many people in this room are angry? Raise your hand. Everybody raised their hand, including the janitor who was in the back of the room, the librarian and the teacher. I said, sit down. And everybody sat. And then I just leaned forward and said, I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> and I told them, a sort of classic Japanese Zen story about a violent samurai warrior who was obsessed with the question, you might know the story, of what is the difference between heaven and hell? And the monk, he was asking, kept saying, wait a minute, I'm going to put some water up for tea. I have a question. Just wait a minute, I, I'm going to pour the tea. I have a question. Let me move the flowers over. And enraged, the warrior lifted up his sword and said, I have a question. And the monk said, that is hell. And so the warrior put down the sword and the monk said, that is heaven. While I told this small but vibrant story, it was as if some rain fell and sort of like washed over the room and the kids were quiet. But you know how you can feel right before water boils? You can sense that it's about to erupt. I thought if I don't do something quickly, chaos will erupt again. So I just started clapping, let's clap. Everybody started clapping and I said, okay, I'll, let's clap three times and you tell me something you hate. I pointed to somebody who said, I hate school. <laughs> I, I, I hate my mother. I hate my teacher. And they went on and on one after another. No one was without something they hated until someone accidentally blurted out, I hate myself. Mm. And there was a moment of stillness and I leaned toward them almost whispering. And I told them a long Egyptian tale, the essence of which is that there was a boy who was considered so stupid, so ugly, so useless that even the school sent him out on the streets. The only thing he cared about was music. And in this story, he falls in love with a beautiful, young, wealthy woman, you know, wealthy girl. And he realizes she would never care about him. So he heard about a magician, traveled into the desert and literally exchanged his soul. The soul of a charismatic, cruel, authoritarian, fearless man. 
And when he went back, he was hired by kings, other soldiers. And when he finally approached the girl, he discovered that she had actually loved the music that the boy played and that she would never marry anyone else. Mm. And he left for the desert, was never seen again. And somebody called out, hey man, that's like real life. Another, why, why didn't he tell her? And a conversation arose. And then I started clapping again. Okay, now you tell me something you love. I love this, I love that, I love my mother, I love my sneakers, I love food. Until someone blurted out, I love myself. And then together we made a story and I passed out as if they were three years old paper and markers. And taking the subway back home downtown, I was thinking, what happened in that room? What happened as we didn't stop the energy, but actually harvested and used the energy? And how astonishing it was, each one of them imagining, feeling, expressing themselves, associating completely in unique ways, but listening to the same narrative, sharing that experience. And I realized this is how peace begins. You know, there was a great um, West African speaker who was an orator and he was part of UNESCO in the early days. And he used to say, there is big peace and there is little peace, but even a matchstick can burn down an entire village. So it is that incident that really changed me, deepened my interest in not so much of like, let's figure out the lesson of this story or which of the stories I could tell that would be the perfect teaching, but how in the listening itself where the mind and the body suddenly are synchronized in one listen sort of heartfully and imagines becomes everything, cause and consequence, how that can serve in situations that are really difficult. So many, many years later, I was hired in an experimental project through Rutgers University. They had an international peace institute collaborating with a health um, institute. And so they sent me in on these like five to 10 day projects. I went to hospitals, I went to community centers, I went to basements and tenement buildings, I went to schools. And usually it was, you know, I, it was over a period of time. But one morning I was called and I was asked to come in to the Board of Education that there had been um, a murder. They were unsure of what caused it or who caused it, but they had pulled all these kids out of the schoolyard. They were in a room, the teacher was wounded. Um, could I come in and tell a story? And don't worry about it, we'll have guards. So I said, yes, but on the train, of course, I was thinking, why, why did I agree to do this? <laughs> and when I got there, there were the two guards and they had the kids come in individually, drop whatever they had in their pockets. They had already gone through security for any guns or knives or anything like that. But they were putting their iPhones and iPods or iPads into a cardboard box. And I was sitting in front of them and I was going to tell this sort of beautiful Moroccan story. When I looked at them, you know, arms akimbo, you know, just sort of emotionless, but yet there was something I felt in that room that was like despair. So I said, I'm going to tell you a story that I have never told anyone. And this is the story that I have told in many situations because it meets the energy of the situation without pointing at anyone or blaming anyone. This story told to me by um, 
a boy who was at 13 years old during a civil war in Africa, a witness to 50 people being massacred, including his parents, and then a boy that he knew from a neighboring village who had become a child soldier rebel, cutting off his arms with a blunt machete. That alone got everybody's attention because what was this story? And in this story, you know, I told them how it was my job through an organization to meet with this boy who I began to think of as my friend weekly so that he could tell the story of what happened to him. And maybe a year into these meetings, he came to me one day and he said, today I'm going to tell you a story. You asked me how I survive, which is something I often ask because the stories were beyond my comprehension or imagination. And he told the story of three months after what he called the cut. He was in a displaced person's camp and he heard that a friend of his who was in his village and escaped that night was alive. So bandaged, traumatized, he actually hitchhiked to the village where his friend was said to be. When he climbed down from the back of the truck, my friend said he actually came face to face with the boy who had killed his parents and cut off his arms. And it's uh, uh, the end of the war. Nobody's doing anything. Everybody was just hanging out of all ages, milling about, no money, no food. But their eyes met. Now, these kids who are trained to violence are trained through drugs and um, they're often so out of it, they have no idea what they're doing, but these boys knew each other since childhood. So my friend said he was so enraged seeing this boy, he wanted to kill him, but he felt so useless. He, he just turned and started walking away, but the boy kept walking after him, begging him, begging him to look at him, to forgive him, because he said, I, I, blood is haunting me. I didn't know what I was doing. Nobody will take me in. Please, I have no life. You have to forgive me. And my friend said he just kept turning and walking. How could he forgive him? But finally, he heard a sound. He turned, and the boy was lying prostrate on the ground, his head up begging him, crying, please, you have to forgive me. My friend said, well, forgive him. And then suddenly he really looked at him and he thought, I have lost my home, I've lost my arms, I've lost my family, but I didn't lose my heart. And this boy has lost his soul. And he said, I, I can't explain it, but it was as if I had to have every cell of my body agree. He said, and then I forgave him. And he looked at me and he said, and that's when I started to live. In that room, a couple of kids said, wow, I, I wouldn't have forgiven him. Somebody else just said, yeah, you heard what he said. And they started talking to each other. And then I asked them what it reminded them of their own lives. And they started to tell stories back and forth, but not only about the violence, a boy told a story about how his mother had told him walking, escaping from soldiers in China during the revolution, she had sold her only thing of value, a silver bracelet for a bowl of rice to feed her children. They knew nothing about each other. 
then I told them actually a hilarious story um, about sharing with call and response. And they did not call and respond, but they laughed. And then suddenly our two hours was up and they left the room. And I had to pick up the cardboard box with their iPhones and chase them down the hall to give back to them what they definitely did not want to part from when they came in the room. And these are just some of the incidents in which I came to understand that it is engaging someone with the energy of where they are, where you, instead of using what they did as a punishment. It's almost a transmutation with those kids and with high school students in a, a prison. Um, I began to tell them stories and these sort of classic fairy tales with monsters and have them create their own monster, which everyone could do. And some of these kids had murdered before they were 14 years old. Some had raped, other, violent crimes, but yeah, and they made these monsters. And then to their surprise, I had them put a heart somewhere in the monster. Some of them had it like on the edge of a finger. One of them had it outside the monster, but close by, one in the foot, one actually rather close to the chest. And then, we worked on creating stories about these monsters and how these monsters, what changed them? What incident in their life changed them from being um, violent perpetrators to actually using their actual strengths to protect others? So someone once asked me, Laura, is this true? <laughs> And so I, how do you answer a question except with a story when you're a storyteller? So I told him a Nasruddin story. It was told to me by a man in Paris at the Musée de l'Homme once. A, a great, he was the secretary of UNESCO for 37 years. It's how I got to know about Ampate Ba, who said about the little piece and big piece. And he said, Nasruddin, who's a kind of, you know, fool, like a, in Jack stories and so forth once was throwing yogurt in a river that was thought to be polluted. And people were coming and saying, what are you doing throwing yogurt in an already polluted river? And he said, I'm cleaning it. And people said, that is completely idiotic. You cannot clean a polluted river by throwing yogurt in it. And Nasruddin turned and said, what if it works? <laughs> my stories for you. <laughs> well, there are so many things to, to react to. <laughs> Those are amazing stories. I, I think certainly they reflect your ability, ability to read the situation, to read the audience, to read the fourth graders, and to essentially kind of take control you took control of the fourth graders. They needed to be controlled. And then you engaged. I'm going to interrupt you and say, I took control of myself. Mm. I wasn't in control of them. What I was doing was working with the energy, which is now that I train storytellers, I'm getting old. So I do this a lot because I've been lucky. I've been lucky to be trained by others, by peacemakers, by the constellation, by mindfulness instructors so that the, the sensitivity of feeling a situation, and I never know really if I'm correct or not, but I certainly, it's not controlling, it's being with what is happening. I hope you don't mind my saying that. <laughs> no, that's fine, that, that's, that's excellent, that's a great point. <laughs> and I like the way that you engage the audience very quick, even, even including the janitor, the teacher, <laughs> I mean, they all got very much engaged in what you were doing. And, and like we've talked about before in, in this series is that whenever someone is telling a story, 
there are really two stories going on. There's the one that the teller is sharing, and then there's also the stories that are going on in the minds of the, in the hearts of the, of the audience. And that was, you can certainly tell that's the case of what you were, you were doing there. The, I, the second story, the, the idea of forgiveness. We talk about peace, building peace, how to go about doing it. We talk about peace kind of at the, at the international level, at the national, and at the personal level. And what do you think the, what is the role of forgiveness in personal peace? I, I'm not an expert in this. I sense that sometimes forgiveness doesn't mean that one forgets. Mm -hmm or one is not aware of what has taken place. But it's that there's a recognition at some point that you spend your own life engaged in rage or revenge or the preoccupation is what renders you um, senseless, um, violent, incapable of uncovering inside yourself the sort of unconditional strength of just being alive. That there is a, it, it's not so much like, um, I forgive you because I'm so such a good person. It's more for me that at some point there is a, you know, you, the best I could do is bring someone to actually feel that the preoccupation with revenge or like repeated stories of what happened and how terrible it was has engaged them in a state of mind that is not that different from a perpetrator or from an addict. And that if through the storytelling, there can be a release, a kind of relief, and you feel that place that's under it all, that is not touched by that, that sometimes you gain enough diff distance, to feel the intimacy of the pain, but also the witness of it, in which you can see that by forgiving this person in a way, you are really releasing yourself from the tyranny of your own mind. And then that person is left with a choice about what they're going to do where before they were either defensive or terrified or shut down. That it's, um, there's a Native American woman who was teaching me so much by Takshibu Hilbert. She was a Salish elder, like a second mother to me. And she always drilled me and would say, what's the bullet of the story? Mm. What's the, not the, the, the moral or like, what it's leading toward, but what is something that happens in the story that opens the mind, it breaks through and opens the mind in, in which you for a moment really feel your contentment, your connection, your heart. So it's that that I'm after. And I think as I get older, I realize I'll do anything <laughs> to make that happen because it's when that happens that someone can even consider forgiving themselves or someone else, or actually can find the, their life source. I mean, it was pretty amazing to me, my friend, um, who said, that's when I started to live. It took him seven years to realize that moment and to be able to articulate it. But it, to be able to articulate it, to tell that story, to be heard thoroughly, actually began to allow him to really, for the first time, tell the story of what happened and to talk about his childhood without breaking down or falling into despair or rage. Well, thank you so much. This, our time has quickly gone by. You're a wonderful teller. Oh, thank and, you. And thank you. So engaging. 
And uh, for our audience, there will be information at the end of this show on, on Laura and information about how her website and that sort of thing. We'll also have a, a slide on the National Peace Alliance and also an informational slide on the Western Maine storytelling. So thank you once again. This has been wonderful. I really enjoyed this, and I'm sure that our audience has too. So thank you, audience, and we look forward to seeing you next time on Telling Tales, Western Maine Story Place, and Building Peace Story by Story. Goodbye. Goodbye.